Good afternoon. My name is Lene Palmasano, and I'm the chair of Committee of the Whole. I'm going to call to order our regular committee meeting for Tuesday, May 9th. And at this time, I'll first ask the clerk to call the roll and verify the presence of a quorum. Councilmember Payne. Present. Wansley. Present. Rainville. Present. Vita. Present. Allison. Here. Osman. Present. Goodman. Who's absent? President Jenkins. Present. Chuck Tai. Ms. Absent. Koski. Present. Johnson. Present. Vice Chair Chavez. Present. Chair Palmasano. Present. We have 11 members present. Thank you. Let the record reflect that we have a quorum. We have five items on the published agenda today in addition to our reports of committees that have met this cycle. Our first item is a presentation of the 2022 Star Awards program, as well as a presenting the Superstar Award winners, a, cer a certificate of commendation as part of Public Service Recognition Week. So before we have that presentation from Deb Kruger, we're going to come to the front um, myself and the other council members that are presenting these awards and do a little presentation where we will ask those winners to come up and stand with us so we can give you your recognition. We'll ask any friends and family or people you might want in a picture to be up to take that photo and then we'll move on to the next Star Awards. So um, one moment please, if I could get myself, council members Johnson, um, Ellison, Vita, and Koski up, up front, thanks. Okay, so here we go, and we'll, if you can all help follow my lead. First, I'd like to invite up Yasna. Yasna Hadzik Stanek, come on up. Welcome here. Um, let's make some room for Haz Yasna at the front. Um, hi there, congratulations. Um, Yasna has won our 2022 City Superstar Award. And here is what that resolution says. Whereas the City Star Award recognizes individuals who go above and beyond job expectations to suggest or to implement ideas that benefit the city, such as productivity improvements or efforts that lead to significant time savings or cost reductions, and whereas Yasna Hadzik Stanek, a transportation planner in Public Works Department, was quick to recognize the need for a new and improved outreach approach to address crime speeding and civil unrest in the communities of Little Earth and 18th Avenue South, part of a public works transportation study and engagement plan, and as a consequence, co chose to co-work in Little Earth offices once per week throughout the study to develop trust and form authentic community connections. And whereas because of her community connections, Yasna was successful in identifying and eliminating many of the typical barriers in such projects and was able to open dialogue with community-based partners, and she was successful in securing grant funds to provide immediate community relief, estimated to have a 7% decrease in the 85th percentile speeds along the street, 19% decrease in daily traffic in the neighborhood, and converted 2,112 square feet of street into community space with pavement art, tables and chairs, and planters full of native plants and trees. And whereas through her work, Yasna has demonstrated the opportunities for rethinking community engagement and partnership as a potential model for future projects and plans. Now therefore be it resolved that the mayor and city council do hereby present the certificate of commendation to Yasna Hadzik Stanek, together with their sincere thanks and appreciation for your work and compliments on being selected as the recipient of the 2022 City Stuber Star Award. Congratulations. So next we'll ask um, for a photo. Yep. Are there people that you'd like to have come on up? This is your official, that was so big enough so I could read. <laughs> no, this is yours, yep. <laughs> come on up. Come on up, welcome. Come on over here. <laughs> Thank you. 
Congratulations. I'm handing off to Councilmember Johnson. All right, well, thank you, Madam Vice President. We've got a number of folks from our Public Works Department here today, so I'd like to call up Scott Wellen, John Stutman, Pete Wosti, Stephen Langham, Matthew Burkholtz, James Keller, and Ryan Schatzko. Come on up. All right. The whole crew here, please come on in. All right, perfect. Well, look at this, this big crew here. So, all right, this is a certificate of commendation for the 2022 CoStar Superstar Award. And I'm going to read the resolution now. Whereas the CoStar Award recognizes teams of employees that develop or implement significant projects or initiatives that contribute to the accomplishments of city goals and priorities. And whereas in 2022, this team of co-stars worked both in the field and behind the scenes to create a system that resulted in zero known at-fault hits to the city's sanitary and stormwater systems, meaning that there were no recorded hits when contractors hit city infrastructure while digging, which reduced the resources required to address and remediate these types of occurrences. And whereas the team's success included creating new automated systems and then integrating those systems with the existing Gopher State One Call system, being perhaps the only jurisdiction in the country developing and using this kind of automated and integrated system. And whereas the team used the city's new integrated automated systems to educate contractors, developers, and others about the physical sites of sanitary and stormwater infrastructure, thereby further minimizing and eliminating potential challenges from errors or accidents in excavation work. And whereas, through this kind of innovation, the city is able to continue offering the best cost-effective service to residents and businesses while reducing claims, litigation, and the cost for system repair. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the mayor and city council do hereby present this certificate of commendation to Scott Whelan, John Studman, uh, Pete Wosti, Stephen Langham, Matthew Burkholz, James Keller, and Ryan Schatzko together with their sincere thanks and appreciation for the work of this team and offers their sincere compliments on them being selected as the recipients of the 2022 CoStar Superstar Award. Thank you. Very impressive work. Thank you. And I'm, I'm going to grab the certificates. And if I messed up anyone's last name, let me know just for the record here. It's OK. Um, hopefully I got it right, but I want to give each one of you one of these. And then, perfect. And let's get in for a, a picture here. Casey, you can direct us. All right. Real close, real tight. All right. Thank you. Are there any family or friends here as well that are able to join us? Yeah. Anyone? Anyone have family or friends here? All right. All good. Thank you. Next, are you three? Oh, we have Council Member Ellison. Thank you. And I would like to invite uh, Monique Fish up here. I'm uh, very excited to be presenting the 2022 Corbell Bright Star, uh, Bright Superstar Award. My apologies. Um, Whereas the Corbell Bright Star Award recognizes employees who demonstrate qualities and attributes that encompass the vision or goals of an employee resource group beyond their assigned roles and responsibilities. And 
whereas Monique Fish, Workforce Coordinator in the Public Works Department, was nominated because of her work in leading and facilitating the department's equity team, including its several focus groups and subgroups, totaling more than 25 employees actively contributing to the advancement of goals that foster a more equitable, rewarding, and positive work environment. And she has personally contributed to building, promoting, and sustaining an inclusive and welcoming uh, work culture. And whereas, through her work in collaborative leadership, Monique has promoted awareness and participation in culture and community events, educational sessions, and activities throughout the year, uh, inspiring new ways of thinking, shared connections, and appreciation. And whereas, Monique embodies the Public Works Department's commitment to city goals centered on inclusion, equity, and respect, and centers those values in her work and in her professional and personal relationships, serving as a mentor, colleague, and friend to many throughout the department and across the city enterprise. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the Mayor and City Council do hereby present this certificate of commendation to Monique Fish, together with their, with their sincere thanks and appreciation for her work and, uh, and uh, accomplishments on being selected as the recipient of the 2022 Corbell Bright Superstar Award. And um, anybody you want to invite up? No. I'm next. And next we have Councilmember Vita. She's all set. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, up next, we are going to award Ethropic Burnett with the North Star Super, the North Superstar Award. Come on up, E. All right. The North Star Award recognizes individual employees who exhibit outstanding leadership, and Ethropic Burnett, a project coordinator in the Health Department's Office of Violence Prevention, now the Neighborhood Safety Department, was tasked with convening, facilitating, and coordinating the multiple stakeholders and interest groups surrounding the intersection of 38th Street and Chicago Avenue, known as George Floyd Square, in the aftermath of Mr. Floyd's murder and the subsequent civil up uprising and unrest. And whereas, through her tremendous efforts and sustained commitment, E, I always just say E, I'm, I'm sorry, <laughs> has earned the respect and trust of the residents and community members, businesses, advocates, and in surrounding, in, and in surrounding the George Floyd Square, as well as elected officials and city leaders, and is now the city's official ambassador and liaison to these important stakeholders in efforts to rebuild, renew, and restore this sacred space. And whereas a project manager, E has contributed to the reopening of the intersection, while at the same time helping to plan and organize memorial events, the disposition of Speedway, and related initiatives, including the 38th Street Thrive Project, beginning her warmth, bringing her warmth and joy, compassion, and infectious positivity. That's so truly. Yeah, it is. It, right, right? Yes, right? it is. <laughs> and energy to all her interactions, partnerships, and collaborations, and whereas Ethropic's willingness to step into and hold space in challenging situations and conversations to demonstrate deep compassion through the most difficult of circumstances and to develop authentic and trusting relationships in the community exemplifies the very essence of what it means to be a North Star. Now, <laughs> Now, therefore, be it resolved, the mayor and the city council do hereby present this certificate of commendation to Ethropic Burnett together with their sincere thanks and appreciation for her work and compliments on being selected as the recipient of the 2022, maybe it's 2023, I don't know. Uh, okay, 2022, thank you, EC, she knows it, North Star Super Award.
Hello. Um, I would like to invite Ricky Reverine up, please. Ricky is here to receive the Shining Star Award. This also goes uh, in collaboration with Sierra Evans, who is un unable to be here today, but so Ricky, you'll accept for the both of you. So, all right. Whereas the Shining Star Award recognizes employees who consistently bring energy, enthusiasm, and positivity to the workplace and improve morale and make others feel valued. And whereas Ricky Reverine and Sierra Evans, housing inspectors in the Regulatory Services Department, while on duty, assisted in providing immediate response and care at a fatal car accident that occurred just north of 26th Street East on Hiawatha Avenue on March 21st, 2022. And whereas during the incident, Sierra quickly engaged emergency response services by calling 911, while Ricky helped to divert and control traffic in the area and even stopped a commercial vehicle that had a fire extinguisher which he used to put out the car fire with an unconscious person trapped inside. And whereas both Ricky and Sierra remained on the scene to continue rendering aid and helping to control the site of the accident until the Minneapolis Fire Department arrived and took control of the incident. Whereas the actions of Ricky Reverine and Sierra Evans demonstrate their personal care and professionalism in the face of challenging situations in the field which are significantly above and beyond their assigned responsibilities, yet contribute to the quality of care, commitment, and compassion that define the high quality of life in Minneapolis. And whereas both Ricky Reverine and Sierra Evans are examples to other employees of going above and beyond their daily assigned duties and expectations to make meaningful impacts on the community and the lives of its residents. Now there, for it be resolved that the mayor and city council do hereby present the certificate of commendation to Ricky Reverine and Sierra Evans together with their sincere thanks and appreciation for their efforts and their compliments on being selected as the recipients of the 2022 Shining Superstar Award. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, everybody. Now we're going to have Deb Kruger. Um, I'm sorry, Mr. Carl, go right ahead. So um, while the council members are going back to their seats uh, to quickly transition, I would just say the next presentation is by the chair of the uh, Employee Star Awards program, Deb Kruger, who is a manager in our human resources department. And I wanted to quickly jump in and help introduce her because the Star Awards program is uh, administered and controlled or managed, I should say, by a group of employees who care very much about this workforce and about their colleagues in all of the departments. And Deb has had the challenge of leading that group and the opportunity to really bring together some people who care very deeply about this city, about the enterprise, and about the work that they do for the people of Minneapolis every day. Um, she's done a lot of work, and it goes uh, largely unrecognized, Deb for the work that you do to make these award ceremonies happen on behalf of your colleagues. So I wanted on behalf of the STAR Committee to call you up and say thank you for your leadership of that group. I know there are others who are also members of the STAR Committee. So um, Deb Kruger also and the members of the STAR Award deserve recognition for the work they put into making this award ceremony happen year after year. Thank you. Well, good afternoon, Chair Palmasano. Council President Jenkins, members of the Committee of the Whole, um, Deb Kruger, <laughs> Human Resources, probably redundant at that point, right? Um, on behalf of the Star Awards Committee, which I know that there are some members here, but a very dedicated group of 13 um, city employees from multiple departments across the city. Um, and on behalf of all the city employees, I would like to thank you for providing us the opportunity to present some information about the Star Awards Enterprise Recognition Program. And more importantly, I want to thank you for investing your time and the city's money um, in recognizing city employees. Um, 
it was an honor for me this year as the chair of the Star Awards Committee to hear about some of the fantastic work that goes on, um, sometimes you know, unannounced to the rest of the organization and the superstars that we heard, and that was a sh very small portion of the number of employees who were recognized in all of 2022 as honorees. And I will tell you that I think some of these stories and the work and the dedication and the passion that these city employees bring every day is very inspiring and I'm proud to call myself a, a co-worker. STAR in the STAR Awards program stands for Special Thanks and Recognition. The program began in 2014 um, as a pilot and developed in response to opportunities identified in um, some of the previous employee engagement results where um, employees felt that they didn't receive enough recognition and um, honor of the work that they do and, and bring. So we, the program is designed to provide enterprise um, recognition options. Of course, there are departmental level supervisor manager and department meetings and that sort of thing. But this is a way to bring the whole city together um, to really shine a light on the good works of, of city employees. There are five categories, the Star Award, um, like JASNA, which is awarded to employees who make a significant impact to the city, co-Star -star Awards, like the ones for the sanitation and stormwater sewer team, awarded to a team who make a significant impact to the city, the Corbell Bright Star, won by the wonderful Monique Fish, awarded to employees who promote equity and foster an inclusive work culture, the North Star, for this year, awarded to E, who's done just some phenomenal work out in the community on behalf of the city. It is awarded to outstanding leaders. And then the Shining Star, which is um, awarded to employees for their positive influence, and this year was represented by Ricky and Sierra. We also have part of the Star Awards program are the Service Stars, which are awarded to employees who've reached significant milestones in the anniversary of working for the city. Though they will receive them at the 15 year 25-year, and 30-year milestones. Um, who is eligible and who's involved? So all city employees are eligible for a STAR Award. Any, any employee can nominate another city employee, colleague, coworker, team of folks that they feel have met the criteria for each award. And then the Star Award Committee, again, a 13-member committee made up of various individuals across the city. Um, we review and approve nominations for the Star Awards. We do that on a quarterly basis. And then after being approved, winners um, are recognized at department-sponsored events, and they also receive a coin um, in the particular category that they won. And then annually, the Star Awards Committee comes together and reviews all of the honorees for the year. And one individual or one team is chosen out of all the honorees in a particular category to be awarded the superstar. And then they're announced um, and receive the special recognition at the ceremony like we had today, which is always held during public service um, recognition week. So for those who are, is this a 2022 or a 2023 award? Um, they actually are from 2022 and the honorees from 2022. It's just we've decided to, to gather and celebrate during public service recognition week, so in 2023. And honorees receive, again, a coin um, in their their particular category that they won, as well as a certificate, um, which comes from their department head. and encourage you know them to have a department meeting and honor and recognize uh, that individual for their accomplishments in 2022 and actually i do need to take this back there were 110 employees who received a star award in 2022 um, three fell off they didn't actually get a coin because they won multiple <laughs> awards in the same category over the year and typically for a team award um, but out of those 100 and 110 we had three city stars 86 co-stars, so lots of team accomplishments, one Corbell Bright, seven North Star, and 10 Shining Star. And then on the right-hand side, you can see that there's a chart if anybody's interested in the departments. Uh, lots of awards uh, last year for Public Works, um, IT, Finance, CPAD, most of them coming from a lot of the um, co-star team, uh, co team awards. 
And then in 2022, we had 137 star service stars awarded, um, 38 for in, um, city employees who reached 15 years of employment with the city, 52 individuals received coins for the 25-year service mark, and 44 employees who've reached 30 years of service in 2022. The Star Award um, Committee, again, made up of 13 individuals. If I could just name them, and if you're in the room, I do see a few of them. Um, Matt Banker from the Assessor, Assessing Department, City, um, City Clerk, Casey Carl, uh, Abriella DeVica from IT, Monique Fish from Public Works, and she also represents MBEN, the Employee Resource Group, uh, Nicole Jevry from Finance and Property Services, Sylvia Gonzalez from CPAD, who also represents the SOMOS Employee Resource Group, Jordan Hooks from Regulatory Services, Charlie Ito from Communications, who also represents the SOGI ERG Group, uh, myself, Kim McDonald from the Police Department, Riley Maynard from the Convention Center, Andy Spazito from the Attorney's Office, and Meg Zapellis from the Fire Department. So a, a nice um, cross range of individuals. Um, in terms of next steps for the Star Awards program, um, I, again, I became, um, in my, my new role as Director of HR Operations, <clears throat> Business Operations, uh, chairing the Star Awards Committee, and I will tell you, I have met with the committee a couple of times, and the passion and dedication that they have, and what they strive for to have meaningful recognition for city employees throughout the enterprise, um, they are bringing some really phenomenal collective feedback on what that means for individuals throughout the city, right? This was the ninth year of the Star Awards program, and it's been about five years since we've looked at improvements, so 2023, I look forward to having a year of improvements. We have a number of new committee members who are bringing fresh ideas, um, and we're gonna con uh, continue to encourage city leaders to promote the program in the respective departments. And the not, uh, just as an FYI for anyone who wants to, has thought of some really great uh, city employees to nominate in 2023, you can nominate all year long, um, and through they're accepted through December 31st, and then quarterly, um, we will do recognition um, in city talk every quarter, and the next quarter uh, nominations will be for those submitted through June 30th. So we're looking forward to continuing um, thinking about new and innovative ways to recognize our city employees for the wonderful work. And again, I want to thank um, the committee so much for, again, the time, the money, and the commitment to employee recognition. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, and thank you to all of our public service workers um, and a nice way to highlight this week. Um, I'll ask the clerk to please file that report. Um, and moving on to item number two. Uh, I am using speaker management. Item number two is authorizing the Ward 12 appointment of Derek Vorpal to the new Community Commission on Police Oversight. All the other appointments to this body were made at the April 27th meeting of council, but due to last minute withdrawals, um, we were not able to take action on the Ward 12 appointment. So while this would normally go through the Public Health and Safety Committee, um, I've agreed to add Mr. Vorpal's appointment to today's agenda just to ensure we have a full membership at the body's upcoming first meeting and that he gets included in all of the um, very necessary onboarding that is happening. So is there any discussion on this item? Um, seeing none, Councilmember Johnson, would you like to move approval of this consent agenda item? Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. I'm happy to move approval and appreciate my colleagues' uh, patience as we dealt with that uh, uh, update related to the original appointee. Thank you. Thank you. I'll second that. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed? That carries in the consent agenda aye. item is approved. Um, our third item is our annual report of the Minneapolis Ethical Practices Board. Staff does not have a presentation for this item today, but is on hand if my colleagues have any questions. Are there any questions for staff? Councilmember Wanson. Thank you, Chair Pomisano. Um, 
Also, thanks to the staff for getting this together. Um, I did have a, a question in terms of, I know city employees are required to complete this basic uh, ethics education course. Um, and the report also lists the number of employees who are in compliance by departments. Um, so as of now, it seems, and now being actually going back to December 2022, 55% uh, of the fire department was in compliance and then 30% of the police department was in, well, was not in compliance. Um, so I just wanted to see if there was any staff from HR or a relevant department that could speak to if there's been improvements since December 2022 with those departments. I'm not seeing staff in the room, but I think Clerk Carl might have an appropriate place to help us route this. Uh, Madam, Pre uh, Madam Vice Chair, I was just going to simply say, having been in that position before myself, uh, I know that the city's ethics officer who is in charge of the ethics program does regularly reach out to departments throughout the year. So those, those numbers do change uh, as those reports are made. So it's a static point in time as she's referring to the end of your report. But when we've had employees who are not in compliance, the ethics officer reaches out to us and makes efforts to make sure that we come into compliance very quickly. So I would just offer that as someone who's, who's uh, been in a position where we weren't at 100% compliance. The ethics officer follows up very closely with departments to make sure that they have plans in place to achieve that compliance. So I'm assuming city attorney the, the or ethics officer Susan Trammell would be the best point of contact to figure out since December 2022 kind of where that fluctuations or those levels are. I'm sorry. Uh, <clears throat> uh, Council Vice President, uh, Council Member Wansley, I, I think that's right, and, and uh, it, I can offer up on Susan's behalf that we can pull another report and uh, you know make sure that it's the most current. Thank you. I'm not seeing any other further discussion, so I'll direct the clerk to file that report. There's no action required on that today. Item number four is the approval of appointments to the audit committee, and I will invite up City Auditor Ryan Patrick to give us a presentation on that. Thank you, Chair Palmasano, uh, Council President Jenkins. Uh, just a brief overview of the audit committee appointment process. This one is by no means unique. We didn't invent it. It's one that happens throughout the city for a variety of boards and commissions. Uh, we received applications through the open appointments process. We had staff uh, with a variety of areas of expertise review, the, review those applications and selected candidates for interview based on award diversity experience uh, and the application itself. Those candidates were interviewed by a panel that included me, uh, um, Audit Chair Palmasano and Clerk Casey Carl. And from there, you see the appointments that are in front of you today. Thank you. Um, those are listed. Are, is that the end of your? Yeah, there's yep. no, yeah. Um, are there any questions from my colleagues for the city auditor? I'm not seeing any, so I will move approval of this item and ask for a second. 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 Uh, is there any discussion? Seeing none, um, I'll ask the clerk to call the roll on this item. Councilmember Payne. Aye. Wansley. Aye. Rainville. Aye. Vita. Aye. Ellison. Aye. Osman. Aye. President Jenkins. Aye. Chuktai. Aye. Koski. Aye. Johnson. Aye. Vice Chair Chavez. Aye. Chair Palmasano. Aye. With 12 yeas and one absent. Thank you. That carries and that item is approved. Item number five is the biggest item, longest item on our agenda today. It's the report relo relating to the status and plan development of the legislative department. So I will invite up City Clerk Casey Carl to give that presentation. Welcome. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Casey Carl. Uh, as noted, I have the privilege of serving as clerk of the city of Minneapolis. And today I'm joined with our city auditor, Ryan Patrick, to provide a first report on the status of the legislative department and its future development. We appreciate the opportunity to discuss our work and as I've said before, while we've not had much public attention on the development of the legislative department, much work has been done over the past year. We're excited to discuss our plans and recommendations about next steps for the development of this new department. 
At the beginning, I'd also like to recognize and thank Jody Molinar Hansen and Andrew Hawkins, who are also in the room with us. They are the first members of the auditor's new policy and research division. Uh, both Ms. Molinar Hansen and Mr. Hawkins have been key to our work in preparation for today's report and in the briefings and interviews that have been conducted with council members over the past two months. So to begin, I wanted to review and summarize the directive given to us by Council. As shown on this slide, we received direction in four major categories or subject areas. First, to bring forward recommendations to reform the city's legislative process. As you'll recall, when Council passed the Government Structure Omnibus Ordinance last October, we reserved Chapter 9 specifically to address legislative procedures. The intent, even then, was to examine the legislative process and to codify those reform procedures. That work will result in an ordinance that we will then insert into Chapter 9. Second, and as a cor corollary to uh, the legislative process reform in number one, we were directed to bring forward recommendations to reform the council's rules. Those are the governing framework for how the council conducts its business. Third, we were directed to identify and make recommendations about how to address the governance, management, and operations of the new legislative department itself. The new governance system that was approved by voters combined with the ordinance prescribing the city's structure provide both a broad framework for the department, but we now need to address how the department is managed and how it operates on a day-to-day -day basis within that basic framework. Fourth. The auditor was directed to bring forward recommendations with respect to how that office will support the city council and provide a bridge to the city's administration in its new and expanded role as the council's professional nonpartisan support team. This, of course, must be done in concert with the reconstituted audit committee, which has direct control and oversight of the city auditor. We will be addressing each of these four areas as well as sharing a timeline and what we anticipate would be the next steps in this process. But before digging into those details, I want to try and manage expectations from the beginning. The city, as an enterprise, as you all are well aware, spent most of last year in 2022 focused on framing the organization of the city's executive branch, its administration. And as I said previously, this was necessary because it is the administration that contains about 84% of the city's operating departments that deliver city services and programs. Those are the departments that actually touch the lives of our residents. So addressing that branch first was, necess was uh, necessary. However, as this body is aware, our work to refine the administration and further develop its operation continues and will continue over the next several years. And while that work continues, the city council, as the lead of the legislative department, will need to position itself to more effectively initiate and control its own legislative and policy pro proposals, to plan and provide meaningful opportunities for public participation, to exercise proper review and approval of budget and financing decisions, and of course, to provide effective oversight of the mayor and administration. Our work to develop the legislative department has begun, but that work will not be concluding in the near term. I think there's general awareness that work to fully develop the new department will take several years. We will be pursuing those developments in overlapping phases. So our presentation today is, and should be seen to be, part of the first phase of many phases. We intend to use the bi-monthly reports to this subcommittee as an opportunity to focus on the menu of recommendations and scopes of work that are being pursued. And then between those regular reports, we would look to have additional public meetings, briefings, and any even study sessions where we can take a more focused approach on specific recommendations and issues and get consensus from this body before bringing forward any actual plans. So as a reminder, this slide highlights at a macro perspective the core functions of the City Council and its capacity as the City's legislative and primary policymaking body. The City Council is the elected representative body of the City. Each member is elected by a ward of roughly 33,000 residents. To put that in perspective, that means that each council member represents a constituency that's roughly the same population as the City of Brooklyn Center. For their constituents, council members help to facilitate interactions with the government and provide a variety of constituent services. Collectively, the council enacts local laws and public policies that govern the community, and the council, primarily through its standing committee system, monitors the city's performance and exercises oversight authority to direct the overall city enterprise. 
On the right side of this slide, you can see the various department divisions, units, and teams that are associated with these three primary functions of the council. We've color-coded them to make the alignment between council functions and department divisions more obvious. We won't be addressing structural issues of the department in this presentation today. Those are matters better covered through the budget process. However, I do think it's important to highlight the many investments that Council has made in our department already in just this first year's budget. Through its refinement of the Mayor's budget proposal, Council acted last year to make significant improvements in the Office of City Auditor. Of the original 10 new full-time equivalent requests that we offered for the Auditor's Office, Council authorized fully half in this first year. So we've added five full-time equivalent positions to the Auditor's Office, including two Community Safety Auditors in the Audit Division and three Analyst Positions in the new Policy and Research Division. Plus, the Council injected enhanced operating funds as well on an ongoing basis. So we are grateful for those additional resources as we begin work on establishing the new legislative department. So back to the framework of the four big buckets. As indicated, the first focus area directed by Council is about its legislative process. This slide reflects the actual text of the directive given to us, showing that we were directed to bring forward recommendations that would, one, standardize that process, Two, address public notice and public access issues, including a scalable public engagement process. And three, improve how stakeholders and others can access the process and understand it, which addresses issues tied to access, transparency, as well as what we'll call outreach and education in terms of helping the public understand the legislative process. This has been the primary focus of our work, largely because it is at the heart of everything that the council and its legislative department are intended to do. The legislative process encompasses all of the series and sequencing of steps involved in the council's formal decision-making process. More plainly, it is the method through which public will is translated into public policy. Getting reforms to this process right is key to everything else that we will do. Not surprisingly, we have several structural and procedural reforms to offer. Structural reforms will include those that will be hard-coded into the system. They include things such as timing, order, documentation, public participation, and vote thresholds that are required mostly under applicable state laws and city charter, as well as council rules. Procedural reforms, on the other hand, refer to the more undefined in-between work that's involved in generating policy proposals, capturing legislative intent for those proposals, and providing the objective research and analysis that underpin proposals as they move through the process. That's the squishy sort of intangible in-between work involved in the legislative process. And quite frankly, it's the area that we have observed the most frustration and confusion amongst council members and to be fair, similar confusion and frustration from the administration. As I said, both structural and procedural reforms will be reviewed and recommended. You can see that we're aiming to have final action in that form of an ordinance to codify Chapter 9 done in August this year with an effective date of January 1st, 2024. That would give us the time needed to implement these process reforms, including changes to systems, training, and more. So this piece of our work is time sensitive and will be prioritized over other initiatives included in the directive. Our briefings and interviews with council members over the past two months have been focused primarily on eliciting feedback on your perspectives about the process and your ideas about how to improve it. From those discussions, we've condensed your words into an overarching goal statement and some supporting values and principles to drive our work. And those are shown on this slide. So our driving goal based on your feedback has been captured as ensuring every policy proposal receives deliberate consideration. To achieve that goal, we need to explore the principles that tell us what a deliberate process would look like. And again, using words that you gave to us but condensed into just four terms, we believe that success would be that the legislative process would be, one, understandable. That means that the legislative process would be clear and known to all policymakers, whether newly elected or serving in their 10th term. Equally, the process would be clear and known to departments and to other internal and external stakeholders. 
Two, it would be predictable. That means the legislative process would be orderly, consistent, and standardized. The sequencing of different actions would be known and followed in the same manner, regardless of what that proposal is, who its proponents might be, and its opponents, and it would be agnostic to the issues involved. In other words, the process would be the process, and it would be content neutral. Third, it would be accessible. That means that the legislative process would be open and transparent to all stakeholders and participants, both internal and external, to the city enterprise. And finally, it would be inclusive. We heard that you want the legislative process to be inclusive of multiple diverse perspectives, not just policymakers and staff, but also subject matter experts in various fields, the community, and all of its various constituencies, and that it must be flexible in allowing the council to explore options and opinions so that the outcome is the best policy possible to, be, to meet the needs of this specific city. Hopefully, each of you can see your input reflected in those principles. We chose to limit the number of words and to use words we felt were broad enough in order to capture the various and different viewpoints and perspectives that we received in our interviews and small group discussions with all of you. Personally, I think if we do focus on these principles, then we will be successful at achieving a legislative process reform that is deliberate. So the next two slides, I'd like to talk about the legislative process as it exists today and then the initial reform uh, outline that we would present. So again, here on this slide, you can see the summary of current legislative process. It should look familiar to everyone. This outline has been used many times by me. It's a, an appendix to the council's rules. We've used it in council orientation and training sessions. It is the seven steps on enacting an ordinance. As we consider structural reforms, those that would be hard-coded into policy, there are some things that we would like to address. The step-by-step -step process of formally moving an idea into written form and ultimately through a formal vote into public policy. Based on your feedback and with the feedback from clerks and others who have a primary role in this process, we have recommendations that we think will help us achieve a more deliberative legislative process that aligns with the principles that makes the process understandable, predictable, accessible, and inclusive. Some of the major flaws in the existing process include the following. First, title-only subject introductions have been allowed. This means that introductions and even first readings of ordinances are processed even when there is no draft, no outline, no details of any kind available, not to policymakers, not to staff, and certainly not to the public. The only information available in a title-only introduction is a single sentence that's printed on the agenda identifying what part of the charter or the code would be impacted by an idea but no substance is offered that would give anyone any indication about what the idea is or what its impact might be if adopted. Very bluntly, that's bad policy. It's bad practice, and it often results in bad outcomes, confusion, and unanticipated consequences that have to be cleaned up later. No state legislator can introduce a formal proposal without providing the draft of a bill. I know of no other legislative body that would allow that practice. If the legislative process is to be understood, predictable, and accessible, it must begin here. Title-only subject matter introductions must be eliminated. The other major flaw in our current system is that it doesn't act as a deliberative process, but as a conveyor belt. Assuming an idea gets introduced into the system, even without any details, as I've already explained, it's simply a matter of time until that idea is presented for formal action, usually about two months. No other legislative body, to the best of my knowledge and experience, works that way. The system shouldn't be designed to automatically carry forward proposals, especially bad proposals. Legislative systems here at home and even around the world are designed intentionally to be static. That means the process defaults to no change unless and until there is support from the body to make a change. Advancing a proposal takes work. It takes effort at each stage in the process to ensure there's opportunity for deliberate discussion and debate about the merits of each proposal. At each formal stage, there must be an intentional push to move the proposal forward to the next step. Moving away from a conveyor belt system will force a more deliberate approach to policymaking and provide more opportunities for meaningful participation, both by policymakers, but also for the public and any subject matter experts that might be consulted through that process. And finally, by bringing major decision points to the full city council, we'll address another flaw in the current process. Today, much of the work to actually draft and review policies occurs outside the council chamber. That's outside the view of the public. It means we're failing to follow up on the principles of accessibility and inclusion, 
And we need to reform that process so that all of the major work on policies is done in public view by the full elected body. This slide then shows the legislative process with some of those core reforms. It addresses the flaws in the system I've already described. First and foremost, we've added a pre-legislative work step. This recognizes the feedback we heard from each and every one of you, that the process of just generating an idea and getting a draft prepared lacks any formal structure, guidance, or support. The city auditor will be addressing this in the next several slides in a moment. Recognizing that the pre-work was identified by council members as the most serious flaw from their perspectives, we wanted to also address what we believe are the remaining flaws that impact the council, the administration, and the public. As you can see in the recommended reform process, the full city council would touch every proposal on four separate defined occasions. Those are shown in red with the arrows. Uh, and as you can see then, correspondingly, there would also be specific documentation at each of these occasions, shown in blue, where there would be uh, certain documentation available to all elected policymakers, to departments, and to the public. This change would help to ensure a base level of understanding amongst all of the impacted stakeholders at each of these four critical touch points in the process. It also ensures accessibility for all stakeholders to the same information. Once the idea has been developed in the pre-work stage, this is how we envision it might work. The first step, of course, is the notice. Here, a formal notice would be required just as it is today. And just like today, the notice serves as a heads up to all stakeholders about the general nature of the proposal. At a minimum, the notice must identify the specific portion of the charter or code being impacted and the general subject matter. We are not recommending major changes at this first formal stage. At the next stage, however, we make the most significant reform. Today, the second step includes, following notice, a combination of introduction, first reading, and referral. Those are three separate actions that we've bundled together. It's the first formal vote taken on each proposal. The most important of these three actions is the first reading. Generally, every ordinance must be given two readings, two separate readings. In a legislative context, a reading means that the body has an opportunity to review the actual text of a proposal. However, in Minneapolis, as I said, in the vast majority of instances, the only thing to read is a single sentence on the agenda. Again, that's bad policy and bad process. However, it is often impossible to have a fully prepared draft this early in the process. Plus, it doesn't allow for the inclusion of multiple perspectives and other viewpoints as we're generating an idea. So requiring a full draft at this early stage not only inhibits the potential improvements to a proposal, but it places incredible burden on the staff to produce a draft which ultimately may not be accepted by a majority of the body. Therefore, by removing first reading from this second formal step in the process and introducing a new document called a legislative summary to the introduction and referral step, we would be able to swap out and provide more detail about the substance of the proposal uh, for good decision making. It can be clear and available to everyone uh, and reflect a consensus of the majority of the body. That summary would build upon the initial notice by highlighting the substantive provisions, which could then be used to begin work on any refinements in the form of amendments to be introduced later in the process. The legislative summary would also be a good reference for the public to better understand the intended effect of that proposal and its impact if adopted. We propose that legislative summary would be approved by the city attorney's office, just like ordinances, and could have input from the pre-work efforts by council members, auditors, and others, including experts in the administration. The referral process would then proceed similar to the existing practice today, with proposals being referred by the council to the standing committee having subject matter jurisdiction based on the council's operating structure, which is determined at your organizational meeting at the beginning of each elected term. Committee action is where the bulk of legislative work is done, and we believe there are many benefits to this approach. We make no recommendations to change the existing practices associated with committee work. As is true today, the standing committees take the lead on reviewing, refining, and recommending how proposals should be addressed by the city council. In almost all cases, council's final action is based on the recommendations of its committees. We also agree that the committees are the appropriate venue for ensuring the minimum public input in the form of a public hearing. That is not to say that there aren't other opportunities for meaningful public input that could be incorporated. Merely to say that at a minimum, 
every ordinance and policy proposal would be subject to at least one public hearing that would be conducted by the standing committee having subject matter jurisdiction. That input from the public would also help inform the committee's work to refine and develop formal recommendations for council. The next step in the reform process, number five, would be to have the full council conduct first reading based on its committee recommendations, including any amendments that the committee might offer. This ensures the first reading by the full council has the benefit of the committee's work and the input from the public hearing. All policymakers, staff, and the public would have a full and complete draft of the proposal at this point to review in advance of first reading. By separating and moving first reading to this point in the process, the full council would have an opportunity to consider any needed improvements. First reading under this reformed process essentially acts as a markup session, very similar to what you're used to doing in the budget process, where all 13 council members have an equal opportunity to review and offer further refinements and perfections to the proposals after being worked up by the committee. At the conclusion of first reading, the clerks would update the formal proposal with all approved amendments or other agreed changes by formal direction of the full council and produce a final copy. That copy would be posted for full access by stakeholders and interested parties, as well as the general community, before the next step, which would be second reading by the full council. This process improvement would ensure that the city is able to comply with the statutory requirement that ordinances in a final draft form be posted and available for public access and review no less than 10 days prior to the anticipated final vote on that ordinance. That's found under Minnesota statute section 415.19. So after the first reading, the clerk's office then would take the marked up copy based on input from all council members and committee recommendations and produce a final draft copy that would be posted and made accessible for public access for that 10 day period required by state law. That engrossed copy of the final draft ordinance would then be forwarded to the next regular meeting of this full council for second reading and action. At second reading, council could consider any final amendments to perfect the ordinance. However, the goal at this stage is that any amendments would be limited to those of a very technical nature. Nothing substantive would be brought forward or anticipated at second reading because they should have been worked out at the first reading uh, slash markup. If there are major substantive changes that are necessary, however, at second reading, the process would be to address those amendments and hold the entire proposal over for another, another cycle so that the clerks could prepare and post a final copy for that 10 day period, again, keeping in line with statute. If it is necessary, however, due to timing considerations to amend and take final action at second reading, the rules then could be waived by a two-third majority vote to allow for amendment and final action at second reading. Once the council has completed all of that process, the final ordinance or policy as passed by council would be transmitted to the mayor for consideration as required under the city charter. The mayor's action, publication, codification, indexing, and filing steps shown on this slide don't change from the current process today. This reform, which primarily is accomplished by separating out first reading and putting it later in the process and requiring more consistent documentation throughout the process, we believe would make significant process improvements for everyone. There would be more opportunity for all policymakers, departments, and staff to participate. There would be more information and details about proposals in the form of this mandated documentation shown in blue on the slide throughout the process. The use of first and second readings would align with the original purpose, which was to give policymakers and all stakeholders the chance to digest and to debate the full text of a proposal and to perfect, to perfect those proposals prior to final action. And it would provide a consistent, accessible, and predictable pathway for all ordinances, policies, and other types of official acts the council deems desirable to subject to this legislative process. There are some additional structural changes we would also recommend to further improve the basic process that I've just highlighted, but we'll discuss those more at future meetings. Right now, I'd like to invite Mr. Patrick up to talk a bit about the first major improvement we've addressed, which is that pre-legislative work in step one of the process. These improvements were the focus of our briefings and interviews over the past two months, and I know that these next few slides are of significant interest to council members. So with that, I'll turn the podium over to Mr. Patrick. Mr. Patrick. Chair Palmasano, uh, Council President Jenkins. First, I'd like to thank each and every one of you for the insightful, thoughtful meetings we've had over the past several months. Your candor and feedback about how things are really going behind the scenes is the only way we're able to get to the actual information of what we need to do to help make this process serve your interests. And I, I sincerely, along with my team, wanna thank you for those 
those meetings. It's been it's been very insightful, and that's led to where we are today. This this recognition, and I won't belabor belabor the point as Mr. Carl eloquently described this instance with the pre legislative step. Uh, that's been where we've identified the most issues and opportunities and received the most consistent feedback that this is a, this is a part of the process where people experience challenges. As such, we are uh, recommending a portion of our, our resources be dedicated to this specific process and this step in consultations with the Office of the City Auditor Policy and Research Division. We can assist as part of the on-ramp to the legislative process. There's an idea that's being formed, perhaps it's not fully realized, and you want professional nonpartisan staff to help build out that idea, to help support it and create kind of that bedrock baseline level of information that, that gives you that quality information to put into the legislative process. It increases the quality and can help align with long-term strategic planning as we have a limited team and a limited number of resources you come to us, request for consultations, we can help build that into a plan that makes sure to address all council member needs. Again, we provide nonpartisan neutral research to explore a topic. So this is that baseline of information. It does not replace the partisan functions. You have your own staff, you have your own ideas and input. We're not there to recommend what should or shouldn't happen. We're, we're there to provide that baseline. And we can be a bridge, you know, as we have access via our, our audit charter, we have access to city functions and data, we can help bridge some of those gaps that might otherwise exist based on existing resources. We can inform the introduction and referral stage, that, that initial piece, that first or second very important touch that you see. The quality of information there will allow you to have a free and full discussion. And then we will continue to support you throughout the legislative cycle. As we're part of the upfront process, we can continue to support that piece of legislation, policy, action as it travels through the process. Uh, one of the ways that we've been also informing our work along with the conversations we've had with you is conducting research and reviewing comparable departments and divisions with similar functions across the country. Uh, while we are a unique city, there are other legislatures that have similar functions, and that review helps provide insight. We did some of this uh, prior to the government structure change. Now that things are starting to align and our mission is becoming clear, it's been very helpful to see what other jurisdictions are doing, how they're resourced, and what information they're able to provide. We're also conducting policy case studies. So instead of... Um, Instead of just relying on conversations and whatnot, we are taking actual pieces of policy that move through the current legislative process and using those as examples of how things might have been different had we used a new process. So where were those pain points and opportunities to uh, perhaps have more support? As we use these as kind of test cases, not live test cases, we can help identify those areas that we're missing. And then we're also working on a framework for legislative priorities that is going to help us work plan. So again, we are not, there's not a thousand of us behind the scenes able to support the work. We're a limited number of people and we wanna make sure that we're serving the entire body. And so coming up with a way to assess a matrix, if you will, what are the interests of the council? What are the interests of the committees? How do we, how do we support all of those and make sure that we're recognizing um, the individual council members' needs as well as the will of the body. And the Legislative Priorities Research and Assessment Project, uh, similarly to the risk assessment that we conduct and audit, will help better structure our activities. I'm gonna turn it over to Mr. Carl, again, to continue the presentation. So that finished uh, the first bucket of work directed to us at a high level, summarizing what we've done, where we're going. The second bucket related to uh, the legislative rules of council. We know that the rules address the mechanics of how that process works. So we also understand there will need to be adjustments uh, to reflect that new process. We do not have any recommendations with respect to rules we're talking about today. However, uh, I am happy to share that with council leadership's urging and support, I am uh, putting together and plan to soon launch a series of sort of lunchtime learnings about the council's existing legislative process, the council's existing rules. Um, and so we'll be getting into sort of the legal and legislative framework with which in the council operates, how the rules guide our process, the roles and responsibilities of city council and of its committees, 
um, and also some parliamentary insights into the basics of meetings, motions, and more. So those learning sessions are intended to provide a level set amongst all of us about today's existing process and that framework in which we operate. Um, I'm sure that through those lunch and learn sessions, we'll also generate some feedback about opportunities to make the rules better going forward, and I'll be announcing the dates and times of those sessions in the next few weeks, so stay tuned for more on that. The third bucket that we have deals with the legislative department itself. And so we are excited to be able to provide some recommendations about how to address the governance, the management, and operations of the new legislative department. Um, and you can see that, again, as I mo uh, mentioned at the beginning of this presentation, this will be ongoing work. This is not work that we will conclude this year. This is work that will start this year and carry into the next term and beyond. Um, so we're getting started at this point. Uh, here you can see on this slide the proposed structure that the auditor and I have shared with council leadership. Under section 8.100 of the government structure ordinance, the legislative department is under the general authority of the city council. It constitutes a separate branch of the city government, not part of the administration under the direction or control of the mayor. Its purpose is to provide institutional support and continuity for the city council and for its official function. So, the ordinance provides that for administrative purposes, the city clerk is the head of that department. That means for matters of financial management, personnel administration, and general operations. But the department encompasses the 13 ward offices of the individual council members and your aides. It also includes the office of city auditor, um, but the auditor operates under the direction of an independent audit committee. It includes the office of city clerk. And so the government and management issues or governance and management issues for our department much like the department itself, is a little bit more complex. So this slide shows that structure that uh, Mr. Patrick and I have discussed and shared with council leadership and which we believe uh, will be best at supporting an effective, responsive, and an efficient legislative department. In this model, what you can see is that council delegates to its leadership, its chosen leadership, the responsibility to oversee department operations at a policy level and to give guidance to its operation. The council, through leadership, would delegate day-to-day -day management responsibilities to the city clerk as the department head to be assisted by a management committee or a team. And that management committee would be uh, inclusive of the city clerk and the city auditor, obviously, as the heads of the two respective offices, and their principal deputies, the heads of the major department uh, divisions. So that mirrors the cabinet structure that the mayor, the mayor has in the executive department. Under this model, the council president and vice president acting as a conduit between council and the legislative uh, department management committee would have specific responsibilities for the following. As a first priority, ensuring that the city council has the resources, systems, and support required to uh, fulfill its official and legitimate functions. And as a second priority, ensuring that individual council members have the support that they need to represent and serve their wards and constituents. The department management committee then would be responsible for the operations of the department on a day-to-day -day basis, including the primary function of supporting, strengthening, and sustaining the city council in its official capacities. Uh, generally, even though each department uh, or division of the department uh, contributes to that outcome and we all share that as a common focus, what the management team would be responsible for is supporting the official legislative policymaking oversight and representational functions of council within applicable laws, policies, and regulations. Assisting the council in identifying and setting strategic goals and objectives and being accountable for delivery against those goals and objectives. And finally, for directing department's administration and managing the effective performance of the department while ensuring efficient use of resources. And we believe it will be important too, uh, as the entire enterprise moves through this transition under our new government structure, that our department also play a role in helping uh, all of us to understand the new policy framework. With the City Council as the legislative and primary policymaking body, we need to clarify uh, what that means and what the term policy means. So this is one that lately has become a word we use all the time. Policy is a ubiquitous term. Uh, we use it in a variety of different contexts. And so what I've tried to do here is to visually depict the city's policy framework. It shows the larger, primarily external facing policy framework in the large center square, and then the more narrow and specific internal facing policy framework that addresses the city enterprise to the right. 
Too often, as I said, when we refer to council as the policy-making body of the city, I think that we sometimes get the idea that only council makes policy or it has policy-making authority and that all policies are matters for the city council alone. And that's simply not true. It's just that the term policy is ubiquitous, as I said, and it can be confusing, and we use it in a variety of applications and in multiple different contexts. So, for example, all ordinances are policies. Not all policies are ordinances. For example, we also adopt policies by resolution. Uh, both are policies, but they have different legal weight and they have different uh, uses. A policy enacted by an ordinance ranks higher than a policy enacted by a resolution. So as these examples demonstrate, the term policy can be less than helpful because it's imprecise and has become a universal catch-all for official actions. Um, but at a basic level, I think the term policy means a defined and formalized plan that's used to guide decision-making. Policies can be external to the enterprise, as I've shown here, or internal to the enterprise. External facing policies generally are used to govern the community. These are understood to be our local laws. They are done in the form of an ordinance. Internally facing policies are used to direct, to regulate, and to evaluate the enterprise and its performance. These are generally understood to be rules or standards or even directives and are generally enacted in the form of resolutions. There are many different um, important differences between these two types of policies but perhaps it's easiest to distill them down to this. External facing policies, what I just referred to as local laws, are made for the benefit of the people in the community, while internal facing policies, what we would call rules and standards and directives, are made in the name of those people to meet their needs. Within this legal and legislative framework, the council in partnership with the mayor is responsible for all of the external facing policies of the city. These are prescribed and regulated by authorities delegated under federal and state laws, the city charter, and official acts made by the mayor and council together in the form of local laws, ordinances, and public policies. Under that largest level of policy, the city council and the mayor together also adopt enterprise policies. These are internal facing. The enterprise policies are used to direct and regulate and control the operation of city government and the delivery of its services and programs. This is the highest level of internal facing policies. It's shown off to the right here in this chart. These include resolutions that are adopted to establish policies applicable to the enterprise. And under that level of policy authority then, the mayor, as chief executive officer, has some policy making authority that is separate and distinct from the council. These are what are usually identified as executive orders. An executive order is a policy statement issued by the mayor, generally to provide direction, clarity, or instruction to those offices, departments, and divisions in the administration under the mayor's authority. An executive order may be applicable to the entire administration or to a specific department. Executive orders tend to address administrative, management, and operational issues and provide guidance from the mayor. The compilation of executive orders might be referred to as administration policies to distinguish them from enterprise policies that are done by the council and mayor together. And then as shown here, departments also are delegated authority to make uh, policies that relate to the operation of their specific departments. So as this slide attempts to show, policymaking is a shared endeavor between the council, the mayor, and all departments. The key, I think, is to differentiate between the different levels of policy, whether they're external facing or they're internal facing, and whether they're subject to the control of the city council and the mayor as the combined governing authority of the city, by the mayor acting alone as chief executive, or by the departments in terms of their operations. Over the past year, clarifying these different policy levels and controls led to the adoption of a new policy brought forward by our city attorney that was designed to respect that separation of powers between mayor and council. I'm referring, of course, to our legislative directive policy. And I wanted to briefly highlight a little bit on this. As shown, uh, these are some details about how that policy is intended to work. It's just one tool only one, one of many, that provides council members the ability to request information in support of their official functions from the administration. In fact, as the city attorney indicated at the time that this policy was adopted, the legislative directive format aligns with these sections of our city charter, 7.1 H1B and H2, which deal with the separation of powers. Those sections pertain to the council's legislative policymaking oversight functions 
and requires that information needed to perform those functions be provided by the administration. Along with our interim city operations officer, Heather Johnson, I've spent the last several months uh, collaborating with our departments to train them and their management teams in the use of this new policy and the expectations for how that policy should apply so that the two le the legislative and executive branches can work together. As shown on this slide, the policy is designed and intended to facilitate the free flow of information and productive collaboration between the council and administration as part of good governance. With that outcome in mind, however, the policy respects the division of legislative and executive functions. It means that individual council members can't direct departments, as we've talked about, but that council as a body has the authority to request the information it needs. So within that policy, council members can bring forward directives. And when I've worked with those departments, along with Ms. Johnson, I've reminded them that our preference is to default to informal inquiries so that we don't overwhelm the system with legislative directives. As an easy way to distinguish between informal inquiries and formal directives, um, I like to focus on the three Ps. These are city priorities, policies, and programs. If we're touching on one of those three, three Ps, the priorities, policies, or programs, we are likely dealing with a legislative directive. That's beyond the scope of uh, an inquiry. Uh, they the legislative directives tend to be those things which involve very broad and complex subject matters. They are usually multidisciplinary or multidepartmental. They require significant coordination across the city enterprise and oftentimes would engage external subject matter experts. So in this way, a legislative directive can be an excellent tool used by the council to signal the potential for a new policy proposal or a proposal to change existing policies. The legislative directive is a tool that can request information, data, or program results or information and similar materials from the administration to help inform policymaking processes. So the use of these, as I've said several times, is one tool that can be used and could be part of that pre-legislative work stage. They are useful tools for the council, and as I mentioned, I've done some training with the departments on this new policy. Ms. Johnston and I were speaking about this the other day and realized we've trained departments. We failed to provide the same level of training to council, and so we will be looking as part of these updating meetings that we've talked about at the beginning of this uh, session, doing that same training we've been doing with departments for the council so that you also have the benefit of what we're telling uh, the operating departments. Next, we're going to address the fourth and final bucket of our work directive, which really focuses on the Office of City Auditor. And so I'll turn that final presentation over to Mr. Patrick again. Thank you, Mr. Carl. I, I might just interject to yep. say that um, while I don't yet see anybody in the speaker management queue, I was looking for us to continue this, finish this presentation as questions people might have earlier will get answered through this presentation. But at the end of this presentation, I am interested in having a fulsome discussion of this if if my colleagues are interested. So Absolutely. But there's nobody in queue just yet. Provide some updates from the Office of the City Auditor. Uh, this slide had my fingers crossed and it worked out. Put the slide in here and you all appointed the new members of the audit committee at this meeting. So put this in in advance, but it happened. The organizational meeting on May 22nd will be when they adopt um, and, and vote on the upcoming revised audit charter. That will include a recognition of the work of the policy and research division and how uh, that work is delegated back to council, the work of that, that portion of the city auditor's office. That's the major step coming up. Next is testing the legislative support function. So. We have the charter adoption, the piece is now assigned to council for support. Uh, we intend to do some case studies, benchmarking, uh, and use perhaps some live cases as our process gets, gets further developed, some live consultations so we can actually support your work. Uh, we want to test these proposed processes uh, with pro uh, anticipated legislation and policy work. Uh, so we'll be we'll be meeting with you again over the coming months as we've been doing to solicit that feedback and figure out how we can actually test out some live cases. Uh, and then throughout 2024 and 2025, we'll continue to ref refine the design as we move into the 2026 um, full term cycle, want to have this process up and running. Uh, the final piece I'll talk about is oversight and evaluation. Uh, we've t discussed this at times during our briefings, but it's worth mentioning again. 
there is a portion of the policy and research divisions authorizing uh, section in, in the ordinance that recognizes the ability of this group to perform oversight and evaluation work. So it's a small part of it and kind of differs from the rest of the paragraph that talks about legislative support, but this is certainly a form of legislative support, the oversight and evaluation piece. Uh, so we're working to figure out that kind of direct line. How do we play that oversight and evaluation role that differs from what the audit division does, which is risk-based internal auditing, but direct oversight and evaluation support to the council. Uh, one of those things we've been doing is looking at the number of actions before the council outcomes and benchmarking that with other jurisdictions. So recognizing that perhaps 80 plus percent of the work coming before you constitutes these routine actions and what additional information might you wanna know about those actions themselves, which can help determine how to balance that flow and kind of the quality of actions that come before you so that they align with your, your decision-making authority and your goals as a legislative body. So more to come on the oversight and evaluation piece, but that is a big part of this conversation as we've, we've discussed in our meetings. So we have in front of you anticipated next steps. Again, these upcoming meetings to discuss uh, these regular meetings and then interim meetings to discuss the various components as they arise. Uh, looking forward to a number of other uh, upcoming discussions, and if Mr. Carl has any additional things he'd like to add, I would open and welcome any questions you might have for us. Thank you. I see Councilmember Wansley in queue. Thank you, Chair Palmasano. Uh, first, thank you so much to Clerk Carl as well as Auditor Patrick uh, for your work on this. Um, you know, throughout uh, all of 2022, there was exclusive focus on the executive side, and it left many of us, I, I can speak for myself, you know, very unclear about what the future of the legislative side, what it will hold um, in terms of, you know, its structure and the resources that would be allocated towards it. Um, and a lot of our policy making and oversight function has happened as a result in what feels like a completely unstandardized way. Um, and as you someone named Clerk Carl in your presentation, when you don't have that standardization, um, it leads to bad equity outcomes and also just doesn't allow everyone to fully participate in our local democracy. So I am super grateful that you all are helping us lay out a plan for this legislative department that is consistent, predictable, accessible. Um, and I think slides four and five lay out so clearly what good governance is all about and you know, what it looks like to have an even playing field for representatives to advance their residents' issues and priorities. I um, also wanna highlight again, without that standardized process I can name, it's been the struggle for uh, me to do my job, quite frankly. Um, nearly every legislative cycle that my office has attempted to move forward with a legislative item, we've had to jump through arbitrary hoops in agenda settings and committee meetings, just, just to advance our residents' priorities. Um, and you highlighted some of the components about the legislative directive policy that we passed back in December. Um, but what I've seen, you know, ever since in every single cycle that, you know, I've seen chairs and council leadership kind of change the goalposts of how we request information. Um, and as a result of that and having further conversations about that, um, I've been told both privately and publicly <laughs> in committee meetings you know, where we're trying to advance work that I should be coordinating with department heads and requesting information privately rather than going through the legislative process of our committees or through the process that's laid out in that legislative directive policy that we passed in December, which as from my understanding, that places me in a position of violating that very uh, policy because it's in then violation of government structure, but it's been continuously suggested to me. So, you know, I'm really, really, again, excited about having this standardized process um, because to me, it feels like that based off of these experiences, we've somewhat selectively um, enacted or have uh, abided by the current process that we, we have right now. Um, and, you know, all that said, I do have a couple of questions in terms of, you know, we've seen this past year Having a good process on paper means nothing if our council is not willing to abide by it. Can you elaborate on the accountability measures or mechanisms that you're developing to ensure that this process will not be disregarded um, 
similar to what we're seeing already with existing processes. So just thinking through, have you considered some of those pieces? Uh, certainly. So as we develop a process, I think, you know, as an auditor, I'm always thinking about what controls exist to help make sure a process flows as intended. So as we continue to develop that, certainly mm -hmm. opportunities for that. Uh, and if you see in the goals and values, the one one big thing that we hear constantly from everybody is the transparency element of, of the legislative process. By, by kind of having sunshine on everything that's taking place, it's easier to see how processes play out, therefore easier to diagnose it when things go wrong. So uh, given that transparency and accessibility are big, uh, big asks from everybody on the council, I think it'll be easy to find those those controls that we can put in to make sure that the process works for everyone. And then someone following to that and kind of the point of, you know, you laid out the timeline of how do we finally get to this place where we have a fully operationalized process and then, you know, also department. Um, I'm interested in knowing what do we do now in the intermediate, um, especially in naming, you know, we do still have these shifting goalposts. There's not full um, abidement to the current policies on the books. So, you know, just thinking uh, until we have that standardized process operationalized, what should we do in the meantime uh, for us to be able to get the information that we need uh, to do that oversight work, to do the policy making, that pre-legislative work that you mentioned, um, which is often the places where it feels like it has the most minefields around here and trying to advance work. Would love to get you all's feedback on how we can kind of navigate that until all of this is operationalized. Chair Palmasano, Councilmember Wansley, I think we'll continue to run our council or our our meetings where we're discussing uh, these issues. And as we move from um, this kind of initial ideation design phase to testing and workshopping, we can we can certainly discuss some of that. I don't I don't have a specific answer for you on that right now, but I think that's a great topic to bring up for those future discussions. Mm -hmm. Mr. Carl, do you have anything you'd like to add? Just briefly through the chair, I would also say one of the things I uh, got from council leadership who have a longer tenure, we've had a lot of turnover just in my tenure here. Uh, two of our municipal elections brought seven new council members twice. So that's the vote of the body. There's been enough turnover, I think, in the body, and we're in a two-year term. Going into another two-year term, we changed the government structure that we haven't done enough intentional training with council members about what is your legislative process. You know, you're elected, and we say, this is your process. Um, we give you a quick little orientation uh, at the beginning, which is like drinking out of a fire hose. I think you would all agree. Um, and then we say, okay, go to work. So I think what I heard from council leadership is supplementing and complementing this major reform work. We need to have some deep dives on what exists today so that that can surface a, a more shared sort of common understanding of the process as it exists. And then we can say, oh, that's a pain point as, as the auditors have been doing with you. Like, that's our existing process and it's not working. What can we do? So I don't think that addresses an accountability issue at this point. I think we have to sort of level set and then sort of say, yep, we all have that shared understanding. What does it mean to have this policy or that, that practice or this procedure? Um, and so I, I look forward to doing that. I know that um, when I have one-on-ones with many of you and I, I will nerd out and, and talk for hours and hours about legislative rules and parliamentary procedure, um, uh, until people <laughs> leave the dais, but um, <laughs> I do think that there is um, some value in sort of, of deliberately discussing those matters, which are core to what you do as a body, that we often take for granted, or we say, oh, we'll get to it, and then we never do. And so um, I, was, I was pleased when council leadership said, you need to make this a priority. You need to find the time and put that together. So I have put together an outline of that program, um, and as I said, in the next few weeks, we'll be sending out sort of, here's some first dates, grab your lunch, and let's meet up in the conference room and talk about it. I'm really excited to hear that. Uh, I think a big piece of the, the conversations that I had during my briefings with you all around this is the cultural reset that needs to happen of like, you know, always worked for some, not for all. Um, as we're moving into the standardized process, how do we do that cultural reset for everyone that might be coming in um, or especially in, as we're starting a new term. So I'm really excited to see that program piece of how we start to do some of that reset and regrounding um, around this new process. And then uh, Auditor Patrick, just a follow-up question on one of the things that you raised in terms of testing. So just thinking, you know, I would like to know what, what is a prospective plan around that, just knowing we're in 
May right now. Um, and we have, you know, less than, what is it, seven months or uh, to, to do some of that deep testing around some of the functions that you're looking to uh, move forward in this new legislative department and legislative process. So I was just interested in knowing what, what does that testing, like, do you have a plan for that? And it seems like you said we'll have conversations to figure that out, but yeah, one to know a little bit more of that. Absolutely. Chair Palmasano, Council Member Wansley, we are working on the policy case studies currently, so I think it'll be beneficial for us to work through some of those to really uh, have some not active case studies so that we, we do truly understand the kind of old status and how would we workshop something through the new one. Mm -hmm. I would assume following that will be the opportunity for us to do a bit of planning and meeting with, with council members to try and find some of those opportunities that maybe aren't the highest stakes cases to test the consultation function, but more some of those opportunities where there's alignment and we can provide that, again, that, that nonpartisan neutral backbone research to start. So we would like to test those consultation functions, perhaps not on the most high intensity things that the council's <laughs> raising, but more on some ones where we can see how that plays out and what support we can provide. I would anticipate that, that coming within the next several months. And I can't recall which slide this was on around quality control, but I will say something that has been challenging also this year in regards to legislative directives is that, you know, despite them being very specific in lines of inquiry, um, we're seeing this this pattern of them coming back incomplete. Um, so I, you know, I'm really interested in knowing a little bit more about some of the quality control components that hopefully can be integrated in the testing period, um, you know, so that we're making sure that we are getting the full information that we're requesting as, you know, mandated in our charter. Um, but right now, or over several months, we've seen our legislative directives with, you know, ex entire sections be ignored, or instead of a pre presentation being given on the content of the directive, we're given a completely different narrative. Um, so I'm, yes, wanted to know if there's going to be, you know, a way, and it seems like you're doing training with department heads to try to get that standardization, but those quality control components around the information that this body received that is in alignment with our actions that we're trying to, that we request. Um, so that, you know, we're getting the accurate information uh, that's required for us to do all those functions you laid out. Yeah. Uh, Chair Palmasano, uh, Council Member Wansley, the, uh, the oversight and evaluation piece that I mentioned, if you recall in the last budget process, we were allocated some professional services dollars to support uh, kind of the initial ideation of that. Obviously, our policy and research team's primary focus right now is on legislative process, building out that consultation function. The professional services dollars that were allocated to us, we do intend to do some work specifically in the fiscal analysis in support of the council's review of the mayor's proposed budget. Um, but uh, I think that presents an opportunity to think about those oversight and evaluation components. Um, we, we are in active conversations about how, what that might look like, but, but currently the primary focus is certainly on, on how do we support you and your, your policy making work. Um, I hate to keep saying more to come on that, mm -hmm. but that, that is something that, is, that we are uh, actively considering figuring out how we're going to build that into our work, but also how are we going to support you um, in the fiscal analysis component that was raised so frequently during the last, um, the last budget process? How do we support you in that, that analysis? And this will then extend to the executive side, because again, I, I want to name that right now legislative directives are directed at the executive staff. And that's where I'm seeing the patterns of those directives coming back incomplete. So is the idea that through training of this new process with staff will help to hopefully rectify, in addition to us finally having our own nonpartisan staff who could just give that information to us up front, just thinking, is that part of what you're imagining? It seems like it is. Okay, quick Carl. <laughs> okay, thank you. Councilmember Payne. Thank you, Madam Vice President. Um, I think the formality of this space can give the impression that a presentation of this nature is much more final than it actually is. So I just want to acknowledge that this is a work in, prog in progress um, with these comments. Uh, and I've been really grateful to be in some of our work sessions talking through some of the particulars of this. And I think one of the things that's really critical is making sure that we're, def we're accurately defining the problem as we're proposing the solution, because if we are proposing solutions with an ill-defined problem, um, we may not be getting at the heart of the matter. And one of the problems 
that we were discussing was just kind of some of the, um, the roadblocks and barriers to moving through the legislative process. And the thing that I've been reflecting on since some of those initial conversations is that, you know, there's a difference between, you know, an inefficiency in a process where the process is just not as smooth as it could be, but it's ultimately moving forward. And the intentional placement of roadblocks or friction in that process as a way of undermining it. And that's the thing that I think we're ultimately trying to figure out. And the thing that I've been reflecting on is that some of these roadblocks and barriers are somewhat by design. And I say that to say that I think we on the, this side of the dais need to help hold ourselves accountable to being transparent in our processes. And I think that, um, and this is coming from the perspective of somebody who worked at the staff level in the pre-government structure era, um, some of those roadblocks that prevent policy from moving through the body can be beneficial to elected leaders who would like to keep things um, stuck so that we don't actually have to answer to our community. And so I'm trying to say out loud that I want one of our problems that we're solving for is a level of transparency and accountability to us as elected policymakers because, and I'll use this as an example, uh, we just had a staff report around rent stabilization that now as elected leaders, we can say, well, the staff said we shouldn't do this, when it really ought to be up to us to decide whether or not we should do this. And I don't think that it's fair to our staff to have embedded in a process this opportunity to hide behind staff reports when it's ultimately our decision as elected leaders. So I just wanted to put that out there as one of the problems that I would like to solve for. Um, and then the other piece that I would like to solve for is no matter what steps we have in the process, we need to be well resourced. And one of the things that is a challenge, I think, under the old government structure and remains under the new government structure is tapping into the same administrative staff who are doing day to day operations to do policy making. And so, you know, a lot of us on the dais, on this side of the dais, have said we need a legislative department, and that is true. And there are a lot of administrative um, staffers that exist underneath you know, the authority of the mayor who also do policy work. And I would like us to not just explore adding FTEs to a legislative department, which is essentially what our current roadmap is to support the legislative process. Um, I think we need to start thinking about our core responsibility as city council is legislation and budget. There should be I think the budget office should be a part of the legislative branch. I think that IGR should be a part of the legislative branch. I think NCR can arguably be a part of the legislative branch. And then there are pockets within a number of operating departments that do significant policy research and development work. And I'm thinking uh, departments like CPED come to mind. We need to be very intentional about who does this work and whether or not um, they exist on the legislative side or executive side, because one of the problems that I think we need to solve is, you know, the mayor's veto should come at the end of the legislative process through a formal action, not through influence at the um, staff level within the executive branch. And so oftentimes what can happen, and this, I'm not trying to accuse anybody of anything, this is just oftentimes what happens is there's a policy that's trying to be developed that has some um, political conflict or tension in it Rent stabilization is maybe the most prominent of that in this term, but I don't think that's unique, uh, where there is an opportunity for staff to uh, influence the policy recommendation, and I'm not even saying nefariously so, but what I want is for that staff to be completely dedicated to the legislative process and not have concerns or considerations to what their day-to-day -day capacity is from a operations perspective. So I just wanted to say those are two things that I want us to be very intentional about problem solving around, knowing that this is a work in progress. So it's not just about getting the right steps in place, but it's about having the right structural elements in place so that we can ensure that non-biased, uh, non-partisan research and analysis. Councilmember Johnson. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, and, and before I get to my point, I do want to mention a decorum concern. I heard the words hide behind 
staff reports mentioned, and I am concerned about that from ascribing motives. Uh, and frankly, I think it's uh, insulting um, language that has the ability to escalate things. So I'd urge my colleagues to follow our decorum rules that this council did approve unanimously. Uh, that would be wonderful if we could do that. I also uh, want to thank our staff for their work on this. Thank you, Mr. Patrick. Thank you to Clerk Carl. Thank you to the others involved. I really appreciated this report. I think it's uh, really excellent work, this update, uh, and the ways that you're working to support this body. I think it's important uh, for this body as well. I did have a question for Mr. Carl, but it might also be able to be answered by our city attorney. I did also hear earlier this suggestion that uh, somehow it's in violation of our own approved policies to uh, directly reach out to staff. Could you confirm if that is in violation of our policy for council members to ask questions of our city staff? Through uh, the council vice president, no, uh, council member Johnson, as you know, it is not a violation of the charter or any established rules or policies for council members to connect to staff. What is a violation of the city charter, and certainly the city attorney can, can speak more directly to what the charter says, is that the council and its members and committees and staff, the legislative branch, is prohibited from any effort to interfere, to usurp, to invade, or to give directions to the department. So uh, our policy that we adopted did provide two branches. I only spoke to the formal legislative directive. The informal request process is equally as important. And as I said in my presentation, the informal request is the default, our preference as an organization because we would like that the two options together work, and I think I said this, to facilitate the free flow of information and productive collaboration between executive and legislative branches. Um, very, very, very often uh, departments have and can provide information, and what that policy has done and what we've trained on is that it is to give discretion to departments at what point are we simply providing public data in response to a request to a council member. Often, uh, because the council member needs that information from for some purpose or you're getting it for your constituents. Um, versus, and I use the three Ps as an example, a city policy, a priority, or a program. Once we get into existing priorities, policies, and programs, or the anticipation of changing them, we're talking budget, we're talking resources, we're talking a change in the city's established rules of operation. That automatically puts us in the area of a legislative directive. Very, very often, things aren't that clear cut. And so I use myself in training oftentimes as an example. The guidance we've given departments is if a council member calls um, and the request that they have is for public data that exists that you can produce, um, roughly it should take about five hours. Around five hours is half of one working day. Uh, there are 13 council members, you have two aides each, that's 39 people in the legislative department that are touching departments. So in order to not interrupt the normal planned operations of that department, it's good for us to have some guidelines. A guideline might be about five hours. If you can get that response done in five hours, it's public data, go ahead and do it. But what happens if it's mm, seven hours? Do I say a hard no, that's gotta be a directive? No, you should have the discretion as a department head. This is also why it's very important that we have processes where you may call someone that's not the department head and ask for information. Those department heads and their management teams need to have processes in place to teach all of their staff. If you're contacted by a council member or a ward office, it's fine for you to communicate with them. Make sure you run it up the chain because the lower in the organization, probably they don't have the full context of what that inquiry means. So if the inquiry comes in, let's say you're asking for information from the elections office um, about turnout data across all municipal elections since 1990. That data is all on our website. It might not make sense, however, if I just point you to the website. And maybe you've asked for some comparison data about turnout in specific wards. Could my office do that for you? Absolutely, it's all public data, it's all on our website. But would it make sense if I just gave it to you? Probably not. And I could probably say, you know what, that's gonna take two days to do. And in my negotiation with you to say, how soon do you need that council member? You could say, two weeks is great. I'd say, great, I can get that for you. Even though it's gonna take more than five hours, even though it's gonna take some extra work, I have the ability to work with you and say, let me understand what your request is. Let me see if I can refine that. Let me see if I have the capacity to do it. If I don't, then I can also talk to you about, right now I don't have capacity, these are the things on my desk. Um, but maybe we can negotiate 
two months out. So the goal should always be to work towards an informal request process to the greatest extent possible. And council members and their aides are welcome and encouraged to use that process to work with departments. To the extent, though, that we get into established priorities, policies, and programs that dictate the operations of how the city delivers its services and manages its programs, we are talking about a legislative directive. Those often are much more complex and require a lot more uh, coordination across the enterprise. I spent a lot of time talking. I did start by saying the city attorney who drafted that policy is sitting right at the dais and could probably also give you some more clarity on that. Thank you, Mr. Carl. And what you've described sounds like working with other people in an organization, frankly, and I appreciate that. So it's great to know that it is not a violation of our policy in order to request information or ask for information, that really it's about large, complex requests that take a lot of time or specifically about directing policy. I appreciate uh, the words you used that uh, informal is the default and our preference as an organization and that it's about productive collaboration. And I completely agree with that. I think there's a saying around this around, um, don't call a meeting when you should send an email and don't send an email when you should pick up the phone and those sort of things. I think it's about uh, working together as an organization and promoting that collaboration. So once again, I really appreciate all of this. I'm glad for the clarification. Thank you. Thank you. Council Member Rainville. Thank you. <clears throat> thank you, Madam Chair. So, Mr. Patrick and Clerk Carl, I, I, I also want to thank you. You've done a great job, and I see your staff back there. Thank you. Uh, you're building a house from the bottom. You know, the voters have spoken. Uh, they, they have clearly defined how the city is to be run. You focus on the administrative branch. You got that done. Now you're focusing on the legislative branch. So. Thank you very much for your hard work. Your, your briefing made it very clear to me what you are doing and how well you're doing it. Great gratitude. And uh, to dwell on Council Member Johnson's remark about decorum, I do not feel that uh, the staff who worked on the rent control the, from five different departments, 30 plus staff people, try to influence me as a policymaker. I felt that they gave me the truth as they know it and as the research showed. So I'm, I'm very happy with that staff report. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member Wansley. Thank you, Chair Pomisano. Uh, thank you, Clerk Carl, for um, answering the question. I, I believe it was me who raised the dynamic of violation of uh, our current legislative directive policy, and I will just ground that in a concrete example. Um, so when I brought forward the fiscal analysis of the MDHR settlement agreement um, that was voted down by this body several weeks ago, um, several council members in their comments mentioned will just follow up with staff to get that information. Information that is about a legal settlement that actually touches on the three Ps that you talked about. Apparently had a budget proponent. It dealt with policy and operational dynamics. That felt like something that this body, especially as one that's gonna be overseeing uh, lots of components around this substantial settlement agreement along with the DOJ, that we should be weighing on and that would interrupt substantially. I think, you know, Council Member Johnson writes it was a large complex complex requests that warrant a, a staff direct or legislative direction. So I think in that case, um, we have seen, again, the shifting goalposts of when we want to refer to the formal inquiries or when it's actually time to do the legislative directive process, we have completely circumvented the policy that we've passed. So I think in those situations, and we've seen that in several other examples, other council members can speak to that. If they will, I can only speak to the one that I endured uh, most recently, where that is a violation in many ways, where you're saying circumvent the legislative process for something that is, again, a large, complex request that interferes with the three Ps that should then go through a legislative directive process. And if even in those moments, when we're going through the correct process and folks are still saying, go talk to staff, that's a problem, and that is why I asked the question of what do we do in their intermediate where I think where Council Payne is getting at, it feels like the wild, wild west around here, where it is feeling like people pick and choose um, what political priorities they want to move forward with, and then that gets weaponized during that pre-legislative process, and then prevents us from being able to do our jobs effectively um, and jeopardizes our democracy, and who pays the price in the end for that 
can't, it's not me, it's the residents that you mentioned in terms of those who we represent the size of the city of Brooklyn Center, the 40,000 plus people. So that is, I think, hopefully the problem that we're solving for that the shenanigans that gets played around here, around the pre-legislative process, that gets taken out and we actually have a neutral, standardized, predictable process that everyone can participate in freely and that is learnable or understandable and accessible to anyone who comes in here. Um, and that is the part, that is the part that we need and that's going to be back with a fully staffed, fully resourced, nonpartisan legislative department um, so that we can finally do, those of us who are willing and ready to do the jobs that our residents have elected us to do and advance the working class issues that's gonna improve material conditions for people in this city. Madam Chair, I don't disagree with anything you just said, Councilmember. Um, first. I feel I, I uh, am compelled to sort of make a few points if I can and then maybe sort of a personal point um, on reflection. First and foremost, we have used, and I, I started this, so I'll, be, I'll take credit for this, or responsibility, not credit. Um, blame is, I think, the word that's going to come out of some people's mouths. I have used, and the auditors have picked up on this, and although it is intentional and it's deliberate, it creates unintended consequences, as so many things do. We have used the term nonpartisan to refer to the auditor's office, the clerk's office. That tends to imply that there are partisan actors in the organization, and we tend to sort of point to the administration and say they're partisans. I need to very quickly point out, um, I've been in local government for 25, going on 26 years. I've worked under different forms of government. Um, I work very closely with the heads of all the departments and staff at all levels. They are professionals. They are expert at what they do. They care very deeply. We saw the employee awards this morning. They are not partisans. And so I want to be clear when we use the word partisan, nonpartisan for us, it equally applies to the people in the administration and the 25 departments that happen to be under the mayor. They're also nonpartisan career professionals who do bring their best advice to the table every day. Um, it's, it's concerning to me that perhaps unintentionally trying to distinguish our role as nonpartisan staff, we've created an unintentional divide um, in the body or a misunderstanding of what that means. Um, you certainly as the council have partisan staff in your aides. This is simply a nonpartisan staff. But I, I do want to be quick because people throughout the enterprise watch these proceedings. They think that maybe I'm implying that they're not. And so I want to be very clear. There are professional, expert, nonpartisan people throughout this organization who serve every single day. And I know you know that. I feel compelled to say that because I've used that term and I want to be clear. I'm not suggesting anybody outside of the auditor or the clerk are partisan. They're not. They serve this council. Um, they bring their best uh, to the team because they're not necessarily, I can assure you, thinking about the council. They're thinking about those approximately 33,000 people each of your wards represents and who you, you represent. I, I like to say that the council is the proxy of the people. You are the voice of the people collectively. Um, and those of us drawn to um, careers in government um, respond to that. And, and so when your voices are heard on the dais, it is impactful to us. I want you to know that. Um, two, I want to be able to share, and maybe it's safe to do it because she's not here. Um, Councilmember Goodman made a comment and hold me accountable for what she said, if you can remember this. When we were doing an interview with Councilmember Goodman, who is now going to leave the city council as the longest serving council member in the history of this city, just by the number of terms she served. And we were presenting to her the proposals and I, I was a little nervous, right? I mean, those of us who have known Councilmember Goodman for a long time knows that she can be very passionate, she can be very direct in her response, and she doesn't necessarily want change a lot. Um, she was very excited about what was presented in that room. And she was one of the last people that we talked to, which meant she saw the flip charts with all of your feedback. And she looked around the room and she said, you know, when I joined the council, I was the renegade. I was the upstart. I was the one who questioned everything and didn't like it. And now I'm the longest serving member and I, I find myself defending systems that you know, I helped to build. She said, I think everything on here is right. She said, you're gonna have to blow it up to make it again. Some of these things are just gonna have to be undone. And I thought that was, um, nice to hear from the longest serving council member that it is appropriate for us. We changed our form of government. We've you know, expanded the council's roles. We've created a strong mayor. We've added new departments. Um, and she, said, and she, she didn't question or really push back on any of the things that she saw sort of written up as ideas. She just said, yep, that sounds great. That sounds good. You need that. You need to be pursuing that. You need to be doing that. And sometimes you just got to start from scratch and blow it up. Um, and I think that hopefully is what we heard from all of you too 
I hope that's what you saw reflected in our presentation today. We are literally starting as if it's recreate from ground zero. So hopefully we're able to pull together sort of all of these disparate voices we hear from the council that represent what is a very dynamic community, right? Um, none of your wards are exactly the same. That's part of the beauty of Minneapolis. And so pulling all that together is a challenge. It's a challenge as you work together. It's a challenge for us who work for you. And by that, I mean not just the legislative department. I mean all 25 departments and the 4,000 people who work for the city of Minneapolis every day. We all want to do a good job for you. Um, I know that it's been frustrating for you who are newly elected to, to dig in, and that's what I took away from Councilmember Goodman. She said it shouldn't be that you have to be here 24 years to figure out the process. You should be able to know the process maybe by day five, not day one, but you should be able to come in here and have good staff who really help you embrace that system and understand it. And so what, what I've heard in your feedback, council member, is exactly that, just said differently, said, said from the perspective, of, I am eager to get started. I have a lot of things I want to do on behalf of my ward. I've heard that from all of you. You've all expressed that in different ways. I'm sure Mr. Patrick would, would echo that, and as would his team. Um, hopefully that's what our presentation in the end has presented. And as I said, it would be our goal to come back regularly. We're not looking to wait for two more months to come back. We want those briefings to just be an evolutionary process. We want to have some study sessions. We want to come back to this body more um, uh, as schedule allows to really dig in and say, okay, we think this is the next thing. And thumbs up, thumbs down. Is it right? What would it take? Tweak it a little bit. And then when we get the final approval, moving forward into final action. So. I don't know that that made a lot of sense, but those thoughts were sort of gelling in my head as I sat listening to the rest of the conversation that there are 4,000 people who work here every single day. They bring their best. They are all professionals. Um, we all take very seriously what we hear in this chamber um, because you do represent the people who are our big bosses, the people who are, are the residents of the city of Minneapolis, and we're very excited to do this work. Thank you. Um, I want to... I'll call on Councilmember Payne first, and then I have some final thoughts on what Clerk Carl just said. Councilmember Payne, you're in queue. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Yeah, I actually just got back in the queue just to kind of clarify some of my statements. Apologize, Councilmember Johnson, for any offense that I may have uh, caused by the inelegance of my choice. I was trying to speak in real world examples rather than in hypotheticals, but the, and I think you spoke to this really well, uh, Mr. Clerk. The point I was trying to make is wanting to avoid the appearances of influence, right? Not partisan, um, not biased, but even the appearance of influence because technically your job reports up to an elected leader who's publicly stated what their position on a particular policy is. Um, there's a lot of pressure that you might be under under that circumstance to have influence and bias, bias unconsciously even seep into how you conduct your work. And so um, I, I wasn't my intention to ascribe any motivation about people's current positions on rent stabilization. I was just trying to use a real world example to make that hypothetical case. And you know, we just had our ethics review board. The, even the appearance of things can be as damaging as the thing. And I just want to reiterate that the appearance of influence when staff who who's livelihood is tied to a certain, a certain person's policy goals creates perverse consequences and unintended consequences. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Payne, for those words. They're really thoughtful. Um, I, I do want to just reiterate what Clerk Carl said, that there are subject matter experts across our organization. Um, they serve our city. They serve our council. Uh, and sometimes those are challenging. They're, they're, they're difficult to come stand in front of council um, and give us facts and recommendations from their areas of expertise that they believe some of us will feel are potentially unpopular. Uh, they do not deserve to be disparaged in any way. Um, any characterizations of shenanigans that are happening between city staff or us and our colleagues are untrue and they're unfair. Um, we are all trying to change here and to work differently, to work differently in ways that we've tried to map out um, in that room where we're going through flow charts. Um, but we're really trying to embrace that in a new government structure. There's certainly different ideas around ways that our government could be differently organized than we have so far. Um, I think the best way to, to characterize that, and I had a conversation about some of this with in a different part of the organization with Councilmember Chavez today, 
I think it's just not yet complete, right? We're, we're more than half done. We're, we're certainly not all the way there yet. Um, and maybe we need to change things. But these are ways that we have started this term from scratch. Um, so that, that level of, of respect and helping each other find our way through and to find a new way forward, um, that is what I see city staff and our colleagues working to do together every day. And it is really important to understand that the words that we say from the dais um, are heard pretty loudly through our, throughout our um, employee base um, and throughout the city as a whole. So um, I really appreciate this conversation. Um, Council President, you can have the last word. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I just first want to um, really offer my gratitude and thanks to staff for um, digging into this work. I think that we had a, <clears throat> a voter approved referendum that said change our city government. It has to be done in phases in steps of which we are probably at the second step and there will be several more steps to go <laughs> prior to us really embedding a changed governmental structure for the city of Minneapolis. You mentioned, Kirk Carl, that um, Maybe it'll take five days for some people to understand the processes. Um, but I know that there are governmental bodies that have rules in place for centuries. And it still takes much more than five days to understand those processes. Sure. That includes municipal governments, state governments, federal governments, all throughout the country, and one might even say the world. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I try to be very judicious with my comments on this council. Um, I, I, I try to listen to my colleagues. Um, I try to understand where they may be coming from with the uh, foundation that they are speaking on behalf of making Minneapolis a better place for everybody to live. I would hope that I have the same level of respect from my colleagues as I try to provide to them. Some of the comments that have been made on this dais today and in the past regarding staff, regarding the motives of other council members, et cetera, is very disturbing to me. People step up to work for the city of Minneapolis, to run for office because they want to have a better city for everyone to live in. That is the bottom line, nobody, as far as my time on this planet, and tomorrow will mark my 62nd birthday, there are no people who have the same thoughts and ideas at the same time ever. It doesn't mean they're wrong. It doesn't mean that they're right. Um, so... You know, I, I just want us to all, um, we may have differences of opinions, but I believe our goals are all the same, and I'm going to continue with that. And I'll just end by saying thank you once again to the staff for moving us along on this process to, to develop this legislative process. I think I heard mention that budget is a very important part of this work as well, and that will be the work that I will be trying to move forward to ensure that we can fully staff and fully um, stand up a legislative department that can do this work for us.
Thank you. Thank you. Um, with that, I will ask the clerk to file that report for us. Last but not least, we have Thank our you. reports from the standing committees. Um, those reports of committees will begin with the Business Inspections, Housing, and Zoning Committee. Um, I see, can somebody from Business Inspections, Housing, and Zoning um, give us that report? Councilmember Chugtai has her hand outreach to help us. Thank you. I appreciate it. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. The Business Inspections, Housing, and Zoning Committee will be bringing forward the following um, items to, um, to our council meeting on Thursday. Item number one um, is uh, um, an on-sale liquor license for, uh, for a business in Ward 3. Item number two is a rental hall and extended hours license um, for a business in Ward 10. Item number three is a rental hall license. Um, item number four is the expansion of premises and sidewalk cafe license. Um, item number five is an extended hours license for a business in Ward 2. Item number six is a um, bond issuance for Northrop King Residential Project um, in Northeast. Item number seven is um, tax incre increment financing um, plan and housing revenue bond issuance for the Plymouth Avenue Apartments Project. Um, Item number eight are the liquor license approvals. We have six of them. And item number nine are 71 liquor license renewals. Item number 10 are two gambling license approvals. Um, item number 11 is a transportation network company rate study. Item number 12 is an alley vacation on 28th in Chicago. Um, Item number 13 is a rezoning a portion of 465 Gerard Terrace. Um, item number 14 is a rezoning um, at 13746th Street West. Um, item number 15 is a rezoning at Inglewood Avenue Apartments. And item number 16 uh, is a permanent um, expansion of premises license uh, for a business in Ward 3. Thank you. Um, that's the Business and Inspections, Housing, and Zoning Committee report. Next, we'll hear the Policy and Government Oversight Committee. Councilmember Wansley, would you give that? Thanks. Uh, the Policy and Government Oversight Committee is bringing forward 25 items for approval. Uh, the first being a passage of resolution for 2023 quarterly donation reports. Number two is passage of resolution, resolution for gift acceptance from the Joyce Foundation for travel expenses. Three is passage of resolution for gift acceptance from the Major Cities Chiefs Association for travel expenses. Four is passage of resolution for gift acceptance from the John Jay College of Criminal Justice for travel expenses. Five is a passage of resolution for gift acceptance from the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, Firearms, and Explosives for travel expenses. Number six is a passage of resolution for gift acceptance from the National Association of Counties and Cities Health Official for travel and lodging expenses. Number seven is passage of resolution for gift acceptance from National Association of Counties and Cities Health Officials of travel and lodging expenses. Number eight is passage of resolution for gift acceptance from the West Michigan Sustainable Business Forum of travel and lodging expenses. Number nine is approving a legislative directive related to uh, analysis of hiring practices for public safety workers. 10 is approving transgender equity council reappointments. 11 is authorizing agreements with Excel Energy to purchase renewable electricity from their Renewable Connect program. 12 is accepting bid for Minneapolis maintenance facilities roof replacement project. 13 is accepting bid for pavement sawing. 14 is accepting bid for yard maintenance. 15 is accepting bid for 2023 small diameter pipe cleaning and televising. 
Number 16 is authorizing contract amendment for property maintenance, mowing, and snow uh, removal services. Number 17 is authorizing contract amendment with Prize Brewery for lease space improvements at 550 Casota Avenue Southeast. 18 is authorizing temporary construction easement amendment with Metropolitan Council for the Southwest Light Rail Transit Project. 19 is approving, approving legal uh, settlement workers' compensation claim for David Shepard. 20 is approving legal settlement workers' compensation claim of Wendy Johnson. 21 is approving a legal settlement for a workers' compensation claim of Bruce Smith. 22 is uh, approving a legal settlement worker compensation claim for Danielle Evans. 23 is approving a legal settlement workers' compensation claim of Keith Smith. 24 is approving a legal settlement workers' compensation claim of Paul Hine. And 25 is approving a legal settlement worker compensation claim of Nathan Johnson. With that, stand for any questions. Thank you. Madam, Madam Vice President, with the Vice Chair's um, ap approval, please. Um, there was an item at POGO that was delayed. Um, it was a request for pr uh, classif classified uh, position approval uh, from the Office of Community Safety. And at the POGO meeting, the chair, I think sort of reflecting the uh, consensus of the body, there was no formal draft, directed the city clerk to provide in time for council meeting a directive the council could consider, which would request from the administration an update in terms of um, uh, from a personnel standpoint, which is within the jurisdiction of POGO, the impact of government structure in terms of the number of positions that have been added, positions that have been reclassified, new positions that have approved, and then positions that are anticipated to come forward even within this budget process. Um, and certainly other council members on the dais, including the vice chair, can speak more to that. I just wanted to point out that that was something that I was asked to do. It wasn't reflected in the script that the clerks prepared for the vice chair. That's my fault. The second piece on that is I reached out to our interim chief uh, operations officer to explain this request and discuss the need for support from uh, especially our HR department, human resources department, in responding to that request and was happy to find that she was already um, well on her way to doing an analysis of exactly that scope of work. Mm -hmm. We consulted briefly last night to discuss if her work encompassed all of the specific points that the POGO or the Policy and Government Oversight Committee had identified. I have not had a chance to connect on that, um, but I know that she was already in the process of preparing a report because you, Councilmember Wansley, had asked for similar information previously, and she wanted to be very responsive to that. So um, happily, the work was already underway because you had already requested it, and the COO was responding to that. I asked her to hold off on giving you that information and sharing it with the council until we could confirm that her data and the information she was providing uh, did address all those points that came out of the POGO committee this week. And so I just wanted to bring that up that we either have the answer imminently ready or we will need to make some changes and then bring it forward. Um, and since that happened at POGO and was an agenda item that was published, I wanted to at least raise that. And certainly the vice chair can speak more to that if necessary. Yeah. Thank you, Clerk Crow, uh, for raising that. And yeah, it seems like there will be a motion of some sorts. I know you're working with Chair Ellison to bring forward that for Thursday so this body can be able to vote on that um, and so that the committee can proceed with the next phase of getting that presentation um, and then eventually taking action. So thank you for raising that. Thank you. Next we have the Public Health and Safety Committee. I believe Councilmember Payne can give that report. Thank you, Madam Vice President. The Public Health and Safety Committee is bringing forward three items. Item one is authorizing a partnership agreement with the Natural Resources Defense Council to be a Food Matters City partner. Item number two is authorizing contracts with neighborhood organizations qualifying for the neighborhood's 2020 Shared Resource and Collaborations Fund. Item three is the passage of a resolution appropriating funds to the Office of Arts, Culture, and the Creative Economy for a National Endowment for the Arts grant and I will stand for any questions on these items. Thank you. Next is Public Works and Infrastructure Committee, Council Member Johnson. Thank you, Madam Chair. The Public Works and Infrastructure Committee is bringing for two items this cycle. The first is the 2023 Street Lighting Replacement Project Approval and Assessments. And the second item is a passage of a resolution on the Olson Memorial Highway slash Highway 55 priorities. I'll stand for any questions. Thank you. 
I'm not seeing any, so with that, we have concluded all business to come before committee today. And hearing no objection, I will declare this meeting adjourned. Thank you, everyone. spaces, including their locations and instructions on use, check out the City of Minneapolis website. <laughs> Minneapolis is home to more than 100,000 pets, and with plenty of trails, sidewalks, and dog parks, there are lots of outdoor places to enjoy time with your four-legged friend. And when you're out and about, <laughs>